talk a lot about you know the, the relationships between the different levels of description and so forth. But there are certain features of the actual evolution of the universe and life on Earth that seem to be important. And I wanted to know what people feel about their universality and how uh, important they were or how robust they were in some sense. So one, at a very, very abstract level, is just the development of complexity. From the early universe, which is very simple, it became more complex. Uh, our best theory now says in the future it will eventually go away, that the complexity is a temporary phenomenon. And maybe even the better one to talk about is natural selection. And that might go back to the teleology questions. Um, when we talk about the origin of life, you know, at what point, if, even if we don't know the origin of life, if we, have, if we can talk about what might have happened, at what point would we say, OK, now natural selection is operating? And at the development of society, or, or memes, or uh, any, anything else, is there some demarcation of you know some phase transition in which we say now it is a useful thing to talk about pressures of selection uh, acting on these different pieces of information traveling through time is that something that is under this is not something that's understood by me so is it something that's understood by other people here? so physics is committed to the claim that wherever adaptations emerge anywhere in the universe the only way they could do so is by a process of blind variation and environmental filtration. Okay. And that assurance is vouchsafed to us by the second law of thermodynamics. Okay, I agree on that. And of course that well, means that if that. there are if, if there is complexity and diversity that shows adaptation, it's the result of Darwinian process. And that's guaranteed by ah, physics. That well no, I don't agree with that. I don't think the physicist is committed to yeah. that at all. Say that again? Yeah, say that, say that, that again. That if there is diversity and complexity that re reflects adaptation, then that could only have emerged from zero adaptation via the sec second law of processes as dictated by physics. What does it mean for a bit of complexity to be something Show adaptation? Adaptation, yeah. But to, to is that taking the question a little no, bit? No, ad adaptation is going to be cashed in in terms of some combination of stability and uh, and uh, replication. Well, so let me see if, uh, if, if this characterizes it. Um, slowing the clock down for a moment, say, you look and click every now and then a mutation happens. Physics explains why, cosmic ray, whatever. Click, click. Um, uh, now, most of those are, are non adaptive. Not adaptive. Once in a blue moon, one of them is adaptive. By the second law. And which ones are adaptive is a function of, depends on A, the, the second law, and mm -hmm. on the myriad details of the particular environment which yes. it happens. Right. So that's the role that history plays. Right. And so evolution is an amplifier of historical accident mm -hmm. and when it starts amplifying, it amplifies blindly. In accordance and, with the second law, it yeah, yeah, amplifies right. wastefully and, yeah, yeah, and yeah. minimal, minimal ener energetic states. But, so, but something that follows from that, I think, is that it's a mistake to ask at what point, where do we draw the line Between. and say, above this is adaptation, below this isn't. Because every thing which is manifestly an adaptation is actually preceded by an indefinitely long sequence of things I, I, which are maybe I'm willing to accept that subject to the understanding that at the start of the process there's zero adaptation. Sure. Okay. Yeah. And then the merest, slightest first unit of adaptation is the product of the operation of the second sure, law. Sure, sure. There's no, there's no and every subsequent choice. addition is also the operation of the second law. Yeah, but I'm not sure what, what, what that, that And that's that. all I was trying to say by saying when adaptation appears, it's driven by the second law. Well, no. See, that's what I'm not, not going to mm -hmm. go because all you're saying there, and I, I would agree, is that all of that adaptation is a process that better be compatible and is facilitated and made possible by, among other things, the second, the second law. Fine, but there is nothing about the second law that I can see that says that there will be adaptation. Absolutely, in any particular exactly right. right. 
right? Right. There, which means it you need could have been that the universe uh, existed for too short a time, or existed right. for a very long time without the first slightest bit of adaptation Correct. occurring. Correct. Because the second law is probabilistic. Correct. So doesn't that imply that therefore natural selection and adaptation are compatible with, but not determined by, the second no. law? What do you no, mean, actually, no? I, so I can I come in on Alex's side this time. Um, I think that you know there is this debate we always have with the creationists when they say, you know, well, life couldn't have just happened because the second law says everything winds down and so forth. And I think that's a misunderstanding of entropy in the second law, and Alex would certainly agree with me there. But I would even go further to say that uh, forgetting about life and adaptation and just sticking to a somewhat easier to define notion of complexity, I think one can make the argument that the evolution of complexity from simplicity requires the second law, requires the uh, entropy you know, to be way far from equilibrium, mm -hmm. and entropy is increasing. And mm -hmm. I almost want to say, except then Alex would start disagreeing with me, that uh, the reason why complexity appears is because the universe wants to generate more entropy. No. <laughs> No, but, 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 <laughs> Sean, Sean, I'm just saying that. To yeah, you, you Sean, know, but, but I still, I don't, I don't understand why you're saying that uh, you're putting it that way, or Alex is putting it that way. I mean, nobody's denying here that evolution requires the second law. Mm -hmm. We're simply saying that that's not the only thing that it requires, and therefore the second law doesn't determine it. No, no, I, I agree, but there's, there is right. there's there's a a difference ground there. in between those two statements you made, which is that I, I would say that. There is a sense in which evolution or complexity or whatever is sort of a spin-off of the second law. Okay. And it, you know, it's not just that it requires it and also other things. It's that it's a very natural consequence under very wide ranges of conditions. But, but, but I think what... Well, I think... We don't know. What well, Massimo is concerned is that nobody make the mistake that was that actually that Richard pointed out before. And that is of thinking that there's something like momentum in evolution. Mm -hmm. So that, right, you think, well, the second law is going to guarantee. No, it's going to guarantee nothing because maybe, maybe every evolutionary tra track we look at dies out almost immediately. Mm -hmm. It happens eventually that some things, but, cool. but don't think that. That once it gets going, it's bound to continue. Not, not only that, but when you say bad. it happened uh, under a wide range of conditions, we don't know that. No, no we, we don't only have n equal one. Remember? That, that's fine. Mm -hmm. right. So let me give a tiny little bit of data, which is very, very, very tiny, but it's the data that I have. Uh, so, and again, since I'm a physicist, I'm thinking about complexity more than evolution in particular. But I think the complexity would come first, and then you can start talking about evolution. So, the level of my ability to understand things is mixing milk into coffee. So if you imagine, you know, you have a little bit of milk on top of your cup of coffee. That's a very simple system. Milk's on top, coffee's on the bottom. And I'm defining simplicity versus complexity as sort of the um, commodore of complexity. That is to say, how much data would I need to give you to fully tell you what you were seeing when you looked at the thing? So if all the milk's on the top and all the coffee's on the bottom, that's it. I just described the whole system. It's simple. It's also low entropy, right? It's a maximal separation between the milk and the coffee. If I mix them all together, then it's again simple. They're all mixed together. That's all I, all I need to tell you. In the coarse-grained description, mm -hmm. uh, the information is conserved, actually, in the fine-grained description. But it's, in the coarse-grained description, it's very simple. But it's high entropy. It's as mixed as it could get. So the interesting question relevant to this discussion is, what is the trajectory from the simple low entropy configuration to the simple high entropy configuration? And it allows for the appearance of complexity. You can have swirls of the coffee and the cream that are very interesting, and you know maybe there's little life forms that form in them or whatever. Okay, <laughs> it's just a model of the whole universe. The universe was simple and low entropy. It will be simple and high entropy. It is now complex and middle middle entropy. But uh, and so I think you can you can do it, and I have done it. You know, with collaborators, you can sort of ask, well, under different models of how the milk and the coffee mix. How does the complexity evolve? And if, if sort of the, the milk and the coffee are not interacting with each other, moving separately, then you get a little tiny bit of more complexity, but then it fades away. If there's a tight coupling between the milk and the coffee, so that there's only inter, uh, changes at the interface between them, then you get more complexity along the way uh, before it goes down. 
So I, I have no idea whether this is sort of robust and fascinating and interesting and universal and explains <laughs> the existence of life, but you can imagine sort of this, this kind of analysis moving from the second law, which is the foundation of all this stuff, to what other sets of constraints do we have to put on uh, to say that not only is entropy increasing, but the way it is increasing is favors the emergence of complexity and even adaptation and life. So I don't, so I don't, I agree with Massimo in the sense that yes, I don't know the conditions under which it happens, but figuring out the conditions under which it happens seems like a very reasonable research program. So the one thing that's missing in your story is, of course, something analogous to memory, something analogous to genetics. That is, in order for this process in life to get more complex, it basically has to remember. Um, it can't forget what happened uh, the last generation. It can't throw all the information away. You have to accumulate that. You have to accumulate the, the mutations or whatever uh, and throw, throw the vast numbers of those away, but have something that allows you to c accumulate this. And maybe that's the answer to when you can start talking about adaptation. Well, and the key is to accumulate it, you have to continually regenerate constraints, which take work, which generate entropy. Um, that's not a trivial question. How do you do that? Uh, that's, uh, that seems to me a, a question that we've ignored. We, pre we say, yeah, okay, it reproduces, it copies, and we got more of this stuff, and it passes on. I, I think it's a totally non-trivial question to add to this problem of, yeah, okay, more increase of entropy in the, in the total, and yeah, there's, there's self-organization that can show up, um, but it's a bigger story than that. And as I understand the origin of life issue, which is not very well, again, uh, there's a metabolism first school of thought and a replication first school of thought. And uh, since I'm a physicist, I like the metabolism first school of thought because energy and entropy are involved. Mm -hmm. uh, and I can certainly imagine there was this intermediate phase of life where you probably should call it life. It was metabolizing. It had structure and complexity. Uh, and it couldn't replicate yet, right? And so there was no adaptation. There was no natural selection in, in any useful form. But it was there life. There was natural selection. There was no response to selection. Fine. Very good. There's no adaptation. Right. That's right. So why does it stick around? Well, stability. there was just enough of it. stability. Yeah, I mean, you know, there's enough of it, and it wouldn't have stuck around forever unless the mm -hmm. adaptation kicked in. 